Hello everyone, welcome to uh, the Data Farming uh, Axel Space and AgriFutures webinar. Um, today we're covering off um, a, just a, a key factor that we've been working on for, for the last little while, um, which is all about utilising high resolution satellite data in rice production. Um, we thank our sponsors for today and our cooperators, uh, particularly AgriFutures Rice for um, funding a three-year project uh, on this particular area. I'd also like to thank Axel Space, who's one of our key partners delivering the data um, um, to the, to the, through us to the farmers. Um, and we'll hear from myself, uh, Punal from Axel Space in Japan. Uh, we'll have James, James Mann from Yenda Prods who will talk about um, some of the applications on the ground, uh, followed by Andrew, We'll also um, follow up with some of the learnings uh, as we go. So thanks everyone for registering. We've got a great roll up and um, this presentation will be available on YouTube uh, and available to the participants afterwards. So um, firstly, I'll just kick off with a bit of background, I guess, and, and I, I guess why we're here. Um, satellite data has been used really only relatively recently in the rice industry probably for about the last seven years. Uh, and before that was mostly airborne imaging. So where you know, multispectral four, four band sort of cameras were flown over rice fields to get high resolution data. And I guess, you know, rice industry is probably one of the early adopters of, of airborne and satellite data in Australia. Um, many other industries are, are really only just becoming exposed to this kind of technology. and. Now, with the advent of Sentinel satellites back in uh, 2017, um, you know, massive increase in the interest in satellite data. But we're going to show you today about how so, you know, high resolution has really changed the way we, we manage rice crops. And it, it's now pretty much a widely accepted tool to manage, uh, identify crop issues right from pre-plant or plant right through to uh, harvesting. Um, a couple of key points is that a normal index is a NDVI, is, which is the normalised difference vegetation index. I mean, it's widely used across most industries. But we're going to talk a bit today about NDRE as well, which is the normalised difference red edge index. Um, it, it's probably the standard in Australia for, for um, you know, sort of uh, imaging primarily around the high biomass. That's one of the biggest things with rice and cotton um, and sugarcane, for example, corn. When we get that high biomass, it, it tends to uh, saturate out and NDRE is a really good index uh, for that. And um, Cornell will talk briefly too about um, the, the advantage of axle, axle space. Uh, and I guess this forms just to, you know, this is focused today on high res, but I guess the key thing is we're trying to combine this with a whole range of other technologies. Um, it's just not about satellite data. We're, we're actually working with a whole range of technologies like EM or electromagnetic soil mapping. Um, obviously, targeted soil sampling is really important. A lot of these areas you're going to see have been scalped with uh, land levelling to make them very even fields. So you're going to see uh, those problems emerging and, and, and targeted soil sampling is really important. Obviously, yield monitoring and moisture monitoring at harvest time. The, the yield monitor and harvest, and harvest moisture contents are critically important. And obviously bringing in IoT devices like weather stations, soil moisture probes, uh, water height sensors, uh, particularly in rice. So it's not all about just satellites, but this just, you know, it's a combination of those technologies. And last year, as part of this project, we, we, um, we wanted to capture the whole industry. And, and Axel Space was the obvious choice uh, and uh, you know, th this is the capture area that we've, we did last year and we're actually currently imaging right now. Um, we've already got a couple of captures this season, but you can see, you might not be able to see very clearly on this map, but the dark green areas have been captured 10 times uh, during the season. So uh, Axel Space was, we were able to capture that million hectare area 10 times during the rice season and we're able to del deliver data to over 90% of the industry. So it's a fantastic satellite for this particular purpose. I mean, uh, obviously it's not, it's not the highest resolution available on the market, but um, you know, I think there's a, there's a nice, there's a nice um, uh, sort of 
trade-off here between resolution and scale, being able to capture massive areas very, very quickly. So now I'd uh, like to introduce Kunal. Um, Kunal is from uh, Axel Space in Japan. I'll let him uh, jump forward and give us a bit of an overview of what makes the Axel Space satellites so, so different and uh, really important for this project. Thanks, Kunal. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tim Sun. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kunal Rana. I handle global partnership and go-to-market sales strategy for Excel Space. And I think thanks to Tim Sun on giving an overview of how Excel Space and data farming are helping on understanding rice production through our satellite imagery. Just a bit of overview from, uh, from an uh, Excel Space point of view. Okay, uh, uh, we are a highly uh, integrated, uh, vertically integrated organizations. We are into manufacturing of micro uh, satellites. Okay, uh, just on the next slide, uh, Timson. Yeah, so uh, we we are we are one of the key pioneer of micro satellite technology in Japan, and we have been in business since two thousand eight, where we started developing our first micro satellite, and and lot of our micro satellites going on the next slide uh, which shows us what we are doing in terms of our legacy back we started back in 2008 and then we had our first project uh, which was for weather news where we created a uh, micro satellites for weather news tokyo where we the whole satellite was positioned towards understanding the whole climate uh, changes understanding typhoons understanding specific changes in the climate and since then we had multiple projects including our own project called Cruise. Okay, on that we have been working also closely with Tokyo University. We have been working closely with JAXA on one of their key project called Rapis. We have been developing Rapis third generation now with JAXA. And back in 2018, we launched our own uh, uh, microsat called Cruise One A. And then last year we launched four more, which I will talk about a bit more in coming uh, slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so I think I think in terms of uh, data collection, we have been uh, collecting data on a daily basis globally, and and we have been using this data for multiple use cases. One of the important use case is agriculture. On think what uh, uh, Tim Sun and also James Sun will talk about in coming uh, slide. Just on the next slide, uh, the more focus which I want to give it is on what we do in terms of our cruise constellation. It is a Earth, op Earth observation optical constellation, which has six band. And I think one of our key area, which is important and uh, sensors, which is important is red, red edge and near infrared uh, uh, band where we are able to go and capture larger area and able to analyze larger area through this capability. A lot of our data is used for understanding change detection. I think Tim Sun and also James Sun will talk more on how Excel space imagery is getting used on multiple use cases and how we are partnering on those specific area on that. I think the focus is uh, our focus was all, always agriculture. That was our focus. And we have been doing a lot of work when it comes to understanding agriculture back in Japan bank back in Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, and now including Australia and other parts of uh, the globe. I think our even going forward, our focus will be to develop more satellites with a better sensors, better uh, resolutions, and which will be used for a lot of uh, agri use cases, which we will going forward. On the next slide, uh, 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 one of our key area, which is very important, is the SWAT part of it, like. Uh, Tim San mentioned that we will we were able to capture larger areas uh, uh, 10 times in a season, 20 times in a season, because one of our key area from our constellation is our SWAT, which is around 55 kilometers. Uh, and then we are able to capture even at a length of 1000 kilometers in one go, which makes our constellation one of one of those key constellation in this segment where we are able to capture uh, larger areas in in very few uh, uh, specific uh, uh, captures and i think that is one of our key area because for agriculture kind of use cases we are able to capture larger area quickly so that a lot of change detection kind of uh, use cases a lot of uh, use cases where l larger lands are uh, uh, able to be processed and uh, analyzed can be uh, can be done quickly and efficiently through our uh, satellite just going to the next slide where we talk more on our 
product specification uh, where on the next slide currently we we are able to our current product specification comes with a native resolution of 2.5 meter panchromatic and it comes with 5 meter multispectral uh, imagery which is and which comes with a uh, res geo accuracy of 8 meter rmse we are able to that's what if you see the left hand side of that is taiwan okay so if you see that with our capability on swat and with our capability on longer captures we are able to capture the whole taiwan land landmass in two two and a half captures so that is something which is key when it comes to our capability on the next slide uh, uh, I talk a bit more on what are the two products which we are providing to our partners, providing to our uh, uh, customers. Uh, we provide two major products as an offering. One is true color uh, imagery and the another one is multispectral imagery. True color imagery comes with three bands, red, green and blue. And it comes with a native resolution of 2.5 meter pan sharpened RGB. Okay, And for multispectral, we have a the uh, resolution of five meter uh, uh, native and it comes with six band including the additional three bands of uh, uh, red edge near infrared and uh, and pan chromatic i think this is our offering when it comes to uh, providing our key offering to partners like data farming and agri futures and a lot of our partners globally okay and just going to uh, uh, next slide these are some of those this is this is uh, one of those pictures where we have captured uh, the Tokyo Haneda airport with our ground resolution of 2.5 meter, which is uh, two color imagery uh, as part of it. So a lot of our data has been used in, in capturing larger area and understanding the change detection, not only in agriculture, but also in multiple use cases. Just going on next slide, like I mentioned, uh, agriculture being one of our key area uh, and partnering with data farming and agri futures we also see a lot of our data will be used for solving a lot of specific problems globally when it comes to agriculture when it comes to understanding how the whole agriculture has been digitizing how even from a larger farms to smaller farms people will be using and adopting uh, satellite uh, uh, technology and how we can bring value to a lot of even large farmers and smaller farmers across close. I think that is one of our vision when we partner with data farming globally. And just maybe a couple of next slides are some of our captures where we have captures larger uh, for uh, larger areas in agriculture and larger areas globally. I think uh, going to a couple of uh, next slide, one of our key area, which I think from a from an organization point of view is that we have been investing heavily when it comes to building more uh, uh, constellation building constellation with better data quality if you see our currently our data data quality is also good as compared to many other operators in the same segment of 2 2.5 meter uh, resolution our one of our key area is that our data is analytics ready data which has been used for a lot of different uh, use cases including in agriculture where for example the data is seamless and it can be used to derive a lot of value in terms of different indices which has been used in agriculture we have been investing on uh, making our constellation a better constellation we will be launching our next constellation with a view that the data quality will be uh, better than uh, now the resolution will be better and also a lot of the data will be positioned for agriculture use cases globally and Australia uh, being one of our key markets to be as part of it as as my the next slide uh, on the next slide I think this is something which we are planning we are currently in the middle okay we started with one satellite uh, uh, back in 2018 as I was mentioning uh, now we are currently five satellite constellation where we are able to capture every point on earth on every other day basis okay by by next year and uh, we will be launching more satellites and we will be able to capture every point on earth on a daily basis with a capacity of around three lakh square kilometer on a daily basis which will also become uh, uh, which will also become one of our key positioning when it comes to capturing all agricultural land globally okay and providing that data to organizations like data farming and agri futures for their 
kind of uh, use cases to bring value on that. And this is from my side. I will hand it over to again Tim Sal. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, just um, just get your head around that. I mean, that's 30, uh, 30 million hectares a day capture capability next year. I mean, it's uh, it's incredible how you know the space the space race is really pushing the boundaries of what's capable and uh, what the cap you know what the future looks like is you know extremely regular data, very high resolution, and very very good quality. And I mean, just to quickly summarise, mate. I mean, this is the key thing about why I see Axel Space Data as a key component of this project is that you know, this massive capture capability. Um, the quality of the data is very good. Um, some of the other satellites that we've been playing with, quality is not there, and that makes it very hard to do um, you know um, temporal or time-based comparisons. So it's really important the data quality. And, and the red edge component for that NDRE, as I mentioned at the start, there's not that many satellites that have got that red edge ca capability. There's a few, but in the high resolution space, there's not very many. So, you know, to me, they're the big strengths uh, of the actual space ca capabilities um, in, in Constellation. Um, I'll just put up your, there's your, um, your contact card, mate, if anyone wants to reach out and, um, and, and make contact, then feel free to do so. So thanks, mate. Hopefully that's given everyone a good overview. Um, I'll jump now on to, to, to James. And James, just let me know if you want me to push your slides forward if you can't. Um, no, no, all good, mate. All good. All right. Um, I'd like to introduce James Mann from Yender Prods, Yender Producers in, in Yender in New South Wales. Um, as, as, has floated up out of the floodwaters and has, and, uh, <laughs> can give us a bit of a summary about how we're actually using this on the ground. Um, and then we'll follow up with Andrew, Andrew from Terra to, um, to, to, to also talk about how it's being used on the ground. So over to you, James. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, look, what I thought I'd do to give everyone a bit of a background on um, how long we've been using imagery in rice, um, verbrate technologies, and a bit of the way we see it traveling into the future and obviously an example of what we've done so far this year and how it's changed i guess over the last five years predominantly but um so yeah looking basically the end of prods started it was mainly thane pringle utilizing imagery in February eight back in 2000 so it's not a new technology um he dabbled with with a bit of satellite mainly aerial though through either a helicopter or um planes with an nvi camera and as Tim said, um, basically imagery in, through satellites, we didn't really get into, well, we in 2015 they became a little more economically viable for us due to the hectares. Um, and that's when we first started with about 30 metre resolution. Um, and then Sentinel obviously came in a couple of years later and again made it a little more affordable for us to play around with 10 metre, which was perfect for dry land. Um, still has its challenges on the irrigation with our uh, smaller fields and higher biomass crops. There's an example there on the right. So this is from when I first started in 2012, 13. Um, that image there is from 2014. So you can see the resolution is at half a metre. It's quite good quality, don't get me wrong. But um, we always had challenges with this type of imagery and the capturing, basically. So. We always, but the only time we could do it because we had to organise a plane, organise the fields, boundaries had to be uploaded to a plane. The guys had to, do, the pilot and the guy taking the imagery had to have everything sorted. We'd have about three flights over two to three weeks. Um, and if they got missed or PI predictions weren't right, basically there was no image taking at the right time. And with rice, the top dressing time is quite critical. Um, so, Feasibility was the only, we only had the one shot to do it, which was at PI. Um, and it would take from basically the picture being taken to having a variable rate sent to the plane and top dress around five days. So it wasn't a quick process at all. Um, and then there was three people involved. So you get New Year, Christmas and New Year's in, into that period and things go wrong every year. We were working Christmas days, Boxing days, New Year's day most years 
Um, so when we had the opportunity, probably realistically only three, four years ago to try and get into the satellites a bit more um, with a higher resolution. And we've only been dabbling around with the three metre stuff the last couple of years. Um, just that the ability to have it a little bit more autonomous is what's kind of pushed us that way, as I said, yeah, since realistically probably 2018-19. So um, where are we today? Basically, our imagery, which we get, I would have said over, since I've started, 80 to 90% of our fields would have an image taken at PI um, over the years. We, 100% uh, of that now is supplied by satellites. We don't have any airborne imagery taken. Um, it's, on it's on demand. So we basically, as long as there's no cloud cover, and that's the only hindrance we tend to have, um, we can have an image there ready to go and... Even if we have to use the 10 meter to get an idea, we can scroll back a few days. So it's a lot easier than when we had a plane going up. We didn't really have a backup if we didn't get the image at that time. Um, the actual high res imagery has become one of the major layers, most important layers in creating our VR zones. Um, we tend to use a whole range of maps. Um, originally when I started, it was cut and fill an image and yield data was quite important. We've probably backed off the yield data now because most of our work in season is affecting what our yield data shows. So it's not actually a reliable source. And it hasn't been, it, it's a bit hard with rice because some of your poor yielding areas are actually your most, I guess, um, yeah, that's some of your higher nutrition and your better areas. And you may have a cold snap where you get uh, cold damage. So they're not, it's not a reliable map to say what an image is earlier on the season. Um, and we're now we're using a lot more for scouting early on in the season to try and find our poor areas. And then obviously we're working now towards identifying um, problems like weeds, barnyard escape, sturdy door escapes in rice. Um, hopefully there's an opportunity to, to progress that into, into some more useful tools, especially like variable rate herbicide applications. Uh, I think that's going to have a big fit especially with the cost of herbicides in rice. So um, I'll skip on to the next one. So this this is going to be an example we've got. So this page probably had about 12 years worth of variable rate and precision ag data applied to it. I was flicking through the data yesterday. There's a lot on there. But basically what happened in 2019, it was landformed from a border check to a terrace layout. So basically base size doubled. So a lot of dirt was shifted. And the second time it's been shifted, so anyone knows that once it's been moved twice, it's really hard to find where the soil has gone that second time. It was sown into canola, seed canola, so not a reliable, because we have males and females, not a reliable image or yield data map. We went into 2021-22, which was last year, rice, and then rice again this year. Uh, it was just sown on the 3rd of October. We have ever rate seed and started on this farm, so we can do that with the air seeder. Um, we like to do that because we just find our cut areas and our pore sections don't, one, is don't establish very well, and two, don't seem to tiller as well. So whatever we can do to get those areas better, I think it's worth worth trying. And then permanent water was applied about, yeah, seven, eight weeks later, 25th of November. So this is what it looked like yesterday. Um, one picture taken with a drone. And one picture there, just what we normally see when we drive past out of the ute. So you can see there's bare areas where the spray rig went through trying to get um, gramoxone on prior to more rain coming. As we remember, a fair bit of rain at that time of year. So this was 2021-22, last year. So what we have here um, on the left-hand side is the variable rate urea prior to filling up nitrogen. Now, due to cloud, we couldn't get a image, successful image leading up. So what that uh, map there on the left-hand side, that's completely based off mine and the growers' kind of knowledge of the paddock and our historical data and a cut and fill, so a cut and fill map. So that's just kind of what we want. Now, a 10-metre um, image there a week later, 
it was only a week later. You see the green is the higher rate, red and yellow we weren't real confident with, so we just had a bit of a go where we were. And we weren't we weren't too far wrong in where we where we went to. Um, the next image here, so that's at PI, so mid season. So we still had, if you look up along that uh, eastern side, there's a uh, the lighter area there, and also along the north it's lighter again. So we missed a couple of little bits, but that's that's expected when we kind of bait went off a bit of knowledge. But what we have here um, is our variable rate sewing map for this year, and we were pretty happy with what that image showed up, that first image from last year. So we decided to create the zones again, looking off that 2001 image and see how we went. The zones stayed the same for there and for the nitrogen. So our nitrogen there is from 325 to 375, 400. It went out probably at by the end of it. So the zones are roughly drawn on there. We're not, you know, we're not classifying, you know, precision exactly to the centimetre or a metre. We're, um, we're just trying to get those bigger areas right in this, and you can see the variance. Um, again, we had the issue. We didn't have a map to go off because of satellites and the cloud. So we just had to make the call at this stage to, to grab something and go. And we thought, well, this looks pretty good from what we saw at PI last year, but mid-season and what we'd done. So the next photo here um, is this year's image, our first image. So if you can compare what we actually did and what we've um, achieved, through the image, I think that that zone created from last year, that imagery is actually carried over to this year. Um, my thoughts are that that one image from last year has done a quite a good job in identifying our, our zones. Yeah, so I think the next one here. Uh, you can start to see now. So this was only two days ago. I, I was trying to get that high res image, Tim. Um, so we got the one on the left hand side here with our variable rate applied. You can start to see, especially on that eastern side, we're starting to pick up that extra nitrogen is starting to pick up the crop. Plus we've got extra seed, extra starter. So I would have thought in another two to three weeks once we get the mid season and we'll give it another variable rate, another application to even up those areas, come harvest we will be quite a, we'll have quite an even paddock. So well, what that leads us to, you might think, oh, well, you've just done the same things what you did last year, but that gives us more confidence once we come out of rice and get, get I guess, a couple of dry seasons, we're able to put more products like manure and gypsum and start to, to work out what's going on with those areas. Um, it's, it's another layer, it's another tool. It's not the be or to end all one year of imagery, but it's, it's definitely given us probably the best indicator in crop to to fix those issues and and this you get we can fix a lot of issues in rice with nitrogen so the earlier we can pick those areas up um, the more effective it is if if we were waiting to PI to try and fix this picture up on the left hand side here we won't get much back so the way a ten meter is good but the high resolution it allows us to pick up pick up those variances earlier on in the crop. So we're getting, we're getting a better photo earlier. And then that allows us to have more debt or more control over exactly how much fertilizer we're putting on. Um, yeah, it's, it's critical to, to get it, to get those, I guess those poor areas and the, the areas we need, um, they need that extra fertilizer. The earlier we do it, the better, basically. We don't want to wait till PI like we used to. It, it worked well back then, but this is yeah, the way of the future. Um, in saying that, I just had a, a little summary here. Um, you can see here's the only image we had for November, which is on the left-hand side. You really have to be careful and know your paddy when you do it because the image on the left-hand here would show that there's an area which is poor, but the... On the right, on the far right hand side, it actually looks good. But knowing the paddock and knowing where our weak spots were last year, we know that image wasn't right. And what it actually was, it's, it's a water management, water, where the water was up to and the 
image was taken, so it's being flushed. So we automatically knew that that picture was wrong. It wasn't wrong, it's just not, not going to give us the right zone. So the one thing I would say is don't just grab an image and think, right, let's draw a variable rate off that. You need to put a bit more, I guess, still check the paddock, number one, but have a bit more background knowledge, whether it's your data, whether it's the farmer's knowledge and knowing that that, that area is poor, it's, it's quite critical. Is that um, water, a fair bit of water related, you know, like impact as well, James, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just where the water was up to. So you can say it's halfway, I oh, say, uh, what's well, one third to the east there, it's really red, and that's probably just where the water's up to and it's half, half knocked around. But we know that that area there is actually usually really strong. So it's, it's picking up on that image to the far right. It's actually starting to pick up again. So... Um, the, and that, that high res image on the far right, you can actually see you're picking up where the tractor's driven through or the spray rig's driven through and created those wheel marks and it's actually affected the um, the crop so much it's killed it. But Yeah, so that, um, that right, right-hand side image is one that's just been taken by Axel Space, so that's what, you, what you're seeing there. Yeah, yeah, and I was in that top bay yesterday and there's a bit more water on that bay than... The others so that would have a bit of an effect on that as well it would probably look better than that from what i've seen so um but there's a there's a couple so that little strip on the far right hand side is still there but it's coming like it's it's getting better so and that's that extra nitrogen extra seed extra starter that's um that's been applied so well as i said it's it's going to be it's an invaluable tool with It'll pick up, as you can see, that that picture there, you can definitely see variance through. When you look at it with the naked eye, it looks pretty clean. looks pretty even. You can't tell. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's a it's a tool. Imagery is the tool to go with all those other layers of data that we're collecting throughout the year. Um, and, yeah, as you said, EM, um, your EM, your cut and fill maps, you need to kind of put them together. But I would suggest that, that imagery has now probably become our number one tool and the high res and the, the ability to have it on demand continually coming through has changed, is what's mainly changed that. A um, couple of questions have come through, James. Um, what do you think about, like, timing of applications for nitrogen how does this help you actually determine the right timings or have you got those pretty much set uh, as you go well so the timing if you want to fix any any issues the best time to fix them is as early as you can so either pre-plant and your dry broadcast or yeah manure in a fallow manure we found our poor areas once we in the dry years, we were putting high rates of manure into these cut areas, which we know knew were poor, was evening up the crop quicker than anything we've ever done. So if you can identify those zones, the earlier you do it, the better. So yeah, five years ago, we were doing it all at PI predominantly at mid-season, but our result is, is less. So for drill sowing, do most of it when you fill up because that's when you're going to put the bulk of your nutrients or your nitrogen on. Dry broadcast again. I will do it before you fill up with your nitrogen, your main nitrogen application. But you also have the ability there to fix any issues probably at a mid-season. So around that early December, if you've got any lacking, you'd rather go early to mid-December rather than wait for the issues to still show up at PI three, four weeks later. So the earlier you fix them, the better. That's yeah. And I just wanted to clarify for those that aren't in rice, PI means pinnacle initiation. So when the when the flower head is uh, is emerging, so that you, you know trying to get the bulk of your nutrition on um, up until that point, because I guess rice, uh, James, as you'd agree, there's the it grows extremely rapidly in that first phase, and it's a very long tail. So you've got to get it set up. You've got a very short amount of time to get it set up properly for for its for its success uh, later on. Yeah, and biomass equals yield. So the big thing is if and it doesn't put much biomass on after PI. So that, that if you've got a poor area, you need to get that nutrition and that nitrogen, but this nitrogen or nitrogen and sulfur, but 
into those poor areas as quick as you can once they've identified. So the earlier you can identify those areas, the better it is. And that's why this high res imagery has just changed. I guess the accuracy of our upfront variable rates. And uh, I'll just make a comment on, that was also P and K mentioned, all that should be done up front because it's not going to move like nitrogen and sulfur is going to move. So it's really about nitrogen and sulfur management in, you know, in that, in this in crop phase. Um, another yeah, quick, another yeah, quick right. question on um, what about pest infestations? Like we've had some inquiry overseas for this. Um, like obviously we get we get, we get duck problems. That's a big pest. <laughs> but what about other pests like army worms and things? Can you see that in imagery or not, James? I think if you start seeing army worms and problems like that with imagery, you've probably missed the boat. That's the only problem. Like yeah. I see escapes from herbicides probably being the best way, but armyworm, by the time an, an image would be able to pick up armyworm, you've probably lost a fair percentage of your flag leaf and vegetation. Mm. So, yep. yeah, yeah, it, it, I don't think, it'd have to be quite frequent and I'd have to be noticing changes quite quite quickly. Um, yeah. If you've got any other questions, feel free to type them into the chat. You'll see them uh, on the uh, top right hand side there's a little chat button um feel free to ask anyone um questions as we go yeah so i'll say tim like this these guys have been doing very right now for or oh, close to 15 years and their paddocks you know we're still very writing paddocks that we were back then it's not it doesn't solve it forever you're not um we're just trying to get that crop even for this year. So that's why the imagery and seeing where it's at, there's a lot of things that go wrong. It's if you want to fix these problems, it's more of a long-term game in terms of manure and um, gypsum and you've got to find out the reasons, but imagery is really good way to get it back in that, in that season. And I guess to help with those zones. Um, yeah. It's a long-term game. Are you seeing any army worm issues uh, in the Riverina? At the moment, no, I haven't seen any. No. Cool. That's no, coming later on. Okay. Still Thanks. trying to get them out of the ground. Some of them, Tim. <laughs> yeah, that's trouble. <laughs> no, yeah. All right. Thanks, mate. That's excellent. Um, I'll jump across to Andrew. Um, I'll just flick your slides up. Mate, I've actually stuffed up and put your slide around the wrong way there. So I'll start with one and go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll and figure it out anyway. So Jimmy's done a fair bit of the heavy lifting, so I don't have to touch on a heap of things in a heap of order. He's pretty well, pretty well noted it. It sounds like we have a lot of the same experiences, or we have had anyway, so. Mm -hmm. That's um, good, that's good to read. Yeah, it must, be, it must be a little bit of a shared passion of mine and yours, Jimmy, because we both talk about it pretty well in the same terms, in the same way, so. Um, yeah, no, nah. so, uh, yeah, I guess I'll pick up where Jimmy left off. We, we're pretty similar, both agros here in Griffith. Um, I think he might have started just a little bit earlier myself, one or two years, so we've sort of come in and, Seen a lot of the same things, a lot of the same progressions. Um, that little throwback he had to start brought back some nightmares. Um, the SST image there, like that he brought up. Yeah, like like he said, the long turnarounds and the bloody days when you're going back in the shop, um, you know, at seven, eight o'clock trying to get something to upload or download uh, are thankfully seemingly a bit of a thing of the past. And that's largely, yeah, thanks to technology like from canal and tim so uh yeah we sort of started off the same way plane flights logistics nightmares um getting big swaths together uh and then we yeah mucked around with the drone and a little bit of that red edge stuff too and that had all its own challenges um it was good because you got what you wanted when you wanted but it had all the other dramas along with it you know timing uh during the day like sunspots and early evening different things like that would affect how the image come out and just an entire bloody of time so you could sort of take it out check a paddock and 
that had landed, you'd go off and then upload it and turn it around. And hopefully you'd have something that was relevant the next sort of day or two. But um, yeah, now with this stuff, I guess it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a step change in the way that we'll uh, manage our crops going forward, which is really positive. Like we've gone from being reactive to being more proactive, which is excellent. Like, I remember when I first sort of started and I was giving a presentation to some drone blokes about how I was using the drone and different things. And at the end, we come to a few questions. Oh, you know, how come it's always just nitrogen that you fix your problems with? And I only just sort of started and I went, oh, I don't know, it's a really good question. I guess that's just always doing what you've always done. Um, and so now, and ever since that point, you know, you go away, you think about things and you got long afternoons in the youth to do that. So the cogs, turn around and as you know you start exploring this stuff the opportunities just open up in front of you like you know we're probably um checking things that we wouldn't normally check like jimmy had a photo up there a little example of just going past the you looking at crop looks pretty even and then you get it up and it looks i'll get a few of mine so and it looks like that from the sky so there's um a fair bit of striping variation in that uh that you wouldn't see otherwise so having the ability to look at an image online that's got great resolution and it's on time means you can go and look at that field look at an area that you probably wouldn't normally otherwise and then make a different decision earlier and get a better outcome so i'll just put your video um, on while you're talking here mate you fly over that you did single gypsum lime manure those type of things so we're already going to be a step ahead by the time it comes to an image at mid-season in terms of variation and we're not just going to be making the mistake that grow i think he was from south australia actually pointed out oh you're just covering it up with nitrogen um so that's jimmy's done really well that's sort of where it's come from and where it is now um I guess where it's going a little bit too, in some respects, is a lot of the um, younger growers I talk to, like the sort of next generation, a lot of them, this is just the way they want to farm. They're used to it. They've grown up with it. They all find it interesting, um, which, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just a farm and a business and dollars and cents. It's, it's their livelihood too. So if you can get someone motivated by um, I suppose things that are a little bit novel now, but then they'll just fit in the program and they'll be second nature down the track. That's fantastic. Um, so I'll see, skip around these images and see if I can jog my memory. Um, you can see that uh, high res image there. It's showing up. A multitude of things in the one photo so like james said we're never not going to be able to walk through a paddock um because there's about four or five different things going on in the bottom left hand corner on the screen where it's completely red that um sort of just suffered from some high water and some cold weather and a bit of herbicide damage and then you tempted to say the stuff that's in the red might be the same but it's got nothing to do with how that bay was treated. It's just salty and struggles to grow. And it's had a fair bit of amelioration that's still getting worked on. Um, so that's just an establishment soil chemistry issue. Um, that I believe is post a variable rate 
from Tim, which they yeah, this, to this, get on. Yeah, this image was actually captured just a couple of days ago, mate. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's 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 picked up to a reasonable degree, but it's already started to sort of go off again. So again, we'll have to do another PI one and do a little bit of a band aid nitrogen thing, which is what we try and avoid. But at it does still work and does still need to be done. So we'll be uh, this one again, maybe between Christmas and New Year, possibly really early in the new year, depending on whether we go early or late PI. But um, it just, it's a really, yeah, as James sort of said, and I'll reiterate, it's a fantastic tool to get ahead of these things early. So even though we're doing this stuff now, um, we've been working on this one for a few years. And some of that, some of that, um the striping left and right, the east-west striping is, um, wasn't caused by fertiliser at all, was it? It was caused by nutrition. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So, I'll try and flip to that image. Um, i just go back up. It was, I think, mate. Um, and, you know. Yeah, so that, that that's, I suppose your, your point, Tim, is exactly right. Like... On the right, you can probably see those seeds there, like, and you know, as an as an agro or a grower, that's essentially at sowing time. That's all you're looking at is a paddock that's been spread and then rolled, and you know, if you got a square meter out and counted the seeds and then moved twelve meters to your left or right, counted them again, did that repeatedly, you might pick up that there's a problem, but who on earth is going to do that? Um, so being able to get an image early and pick that up early it, it it wouldn't be able it wouldn't be possible otherwise essentially so um that's just illustrates you know you you're looking at the scene on the right there and you go oh yeah that looks all right you know you might count a few in a meter and go yeah you got 250 300 seeds a meter most of those come up your crop should look good happy days but yeah in reality you get an issue like that um so and then yeah and then you can still see it carrying on forwards so that's sort of something that'll end up like and again that's a five-day turnaround back in the day to get anything done on that and now it's i think the grower walked in as we happen to be looking at it and we did it up in about well, less than 15 minutes 18 or something so you know to be as reactive as that is something that's new and yeah, really positive. Um, that's just a bit of a photo of one of those bays there. It's an old channel or a roadway or something. Uh, All righty, so. Um, this is another example. Yep, Andrew, sorry, Andrew, yeah. Andrew, quick question. How quickly do you reckon you can pick up that germination uh, establishment sort of thing, uh, striping in the imagery, do you reckon? Uh, in the imagery, you can probably pick it up at about five leaf. So you can probably, you can probably pick it up earlier visually, to be honest, like driving past after a first or a second flush, you, you see those waves a little bit better visually, like, you know, depending on which are you driving afternoon, morning sunlight, that type of thing, you know, what it's a bit like some, you drive around one paddock and from the other side it looks better than the other and vice versa um so in the imagery yeah you'd be able to pick it up probably about from the second flush onwards or depending on if you're just going to permanent uh but yeah like five leaf early tillering you'll start seeing it in the imagery uh but you've got it there in the background to confirm your suspicions i suppose is uh the advantage of the imagery so, for example, this next one uh, you can see on the left and the right hand side of that bank line, that showed up in the imagery essentially straight away. Um, that's the same crop a little bit earlier on. So, I'll, taking that photo would have been standing in between those two paddocks. The one further in the distance has water on it. Uh, and I would have been facing, yeah, towards, you can see that little bit of a V slight shape where the rice has actually come out of the ground and then the other end of the paddock it's still under the ground so you can see that with an image um sort of naught and one essentially but um yeah those 
those slighter variations where there's like a spreader issue are a bit harder to pick up. You wouldn't be able to pick it up quite so early as, as that. That that you can see on an image, that's essentially naught and one. Um, that's that same bank line where you can sort of just make out the crop on the right and try to get it in there is is established and up and the stuff in front of me is still under the ground after a second flush there. So that's one where, yeah, we'll be, we'll be onto that one before the next crop, fixing it up, getting things organized, you know, soil tests. Um, yeah, that we wouldn't have been probably doing without VR, or without VR otherwise, we'd just be getting a plane, having a look at an image and chucking heaps more urea on it probably 10, 15 years ago. So, uh, any more questions on those ones? I think James, yeah, James pretty well covered essentially everything that goes on in the space. Um, that's Let, just this one. You know, you one, one thing you didn't mention, yep. I guess, in the future, potentially is maybe a little bit of space for um, some VR sort of growth regulation. That's something I'd like to get into. Um, there's not much room for it in the rice at the moment, but um, yeah, down the track. Uh, variable rate growth regulators is just again another little tool in the tool belt because yeah even crops are always the highest yielding ones and vice versa the highest yielding crops are always the most uniform ones you can't have four or five acres that lets you down that's a high spot or a weak area that does you know eight ton and drags the yield down so yeah so what you, yeah. um, what's your main aim for plant growth regulators is it to just minimise lodging or or part of the nitrogen management as well? Yeah, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Um, with the higher percentage of drill stain crops now, we don't tend to lodge as many as we do. Um, but And because of all these PR, like these PR things, we don't probably fix as many issues that shouldn't be with nitrogen. So we're not tipping as many crops over. Better varieties help too, obviously. But um, yeah, but equal equal weighting to both those things, Tim. Yeah. Um, so. Can you just go back to? I'll I'll just zoom down to this one for you. Uh, You're right. Yeah. That one there is, is that what? What's is that the EM or is that the image? Yeah, correct. That's the EM of yeah. that of those two paddocks. Um, the one that had the water on it, unfortunately, is still pushing its way out of the water. So there's not a whole lot to look at there. But um, yeah, it just it's interesting to note, obviously, that the V uh, the VR map essentially matched the EM map, as you know you'd hope to expect. You can see an old roadway and stuff. And if we we we'll hopefully do some grid soil testing in there, and those maps no doubt will match what we're seeing there. Um, and we can just yeah keep keep the, keep getting out of these problems and you know as Jimmy said the the earlier we can fix all these problems the easier it makes our life um, around Christmas New Year's when growers ask us how much to put on there's not you know huge big variations of oh we'll put you know nothing here or 75 kilos here and 180 kilos up here and the you know the plane's gonna fly over and try and get that done well good luck you know so yeah. The other thing, I guess, with the plane, it's not it's not that accurate in terms of you're trying to change 25, 50, 100 kilos rates at 200 yeah. k's an hour. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. that's yeah. why we've got to have these big zones and why these zoning tools useful. Yeah, correct. Um, we've, we've, we're running all the same problems, eh, Jimmy? Yeah. So, again, there's another reason why it's better off having it done up front. But the other thing I was going to say about that – that's a good question about how early can you pick up variance in crop because that's our biggest challenge, um, especially with drill sign. A lot of guys like to just get it out of the ground, get it to two to three leaf and fill up. So it's about trying to find a resolution that's going to find that variance or or some. Yeah, Jimmy's better than, than NDRE, than NDVI. Like what can we find that will pick up? those differences it takes that soil color out of the background because yeah you really can do that the US we can variable rate that's, that's why we that's why we had a look at the drone 
Jimmy. And um, and yeah, you could pick things up when you know guys are flushing those crops to add permanent water really quick and really easy with that. And you could crunch it sort of to a lot tighter imagery. Like that's it'd take overnight to bloody crunch it to 50 centimetres or a metre or whatever and pick up those differences. But it's just not practical. It's really... Nah, the, drone, the drones would take you an hour to fly a paddock to get 30, 40 hectares and then another day to process it. But when you look after thousands of hectares, you just can't get across it, where a satellite can do it all in one hit. Yeah, that's it. Nothing crashes in the background too, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think we've touched on all the points. I can't really think of anything else. It's a bit of a no-brainer, really. Like, we've just got to keep walking down this path and and things only get better. Um, the, the technology, the, the, it's really limited your imagination. It's a bit of a cliche, but the, the possibilities are... As, you know, how I haven't found an end to them yet, things keep popping up, so it's it's fantastic, yeah. So the, the high resolution, I think, Tim, would be more important early on in the season than at PI. Because, again, the 10 metre kind of works because if it if the 10 metre can find the variation, well, the plane can probably fix it. Whereas our high resolution is probably more useful early on. And, you know, there's only so much you can do with PI, so it's got to be a fair big diff, fairly big difference, which that 10 metre setting it will fix. That's why I, I'm finding that the most important stuff is the early on variation, such as that there. Like, at least you've got a chance to get that back. You come back a PI there, well, then the crop in those red areas are thin and hasn't done anything. Missed the yeah. boat. Yep. Yeah, welcome to it. 100%. Yep. Yeah, that, that's that's a good example about the plane. So, so how that zone there, if you had automatically created zones, the plane wants to fly north-south there. Yeah, it correct. West. Yeah. So that, that there helps him a lot. Um, rather than trying to fly that east west, having those bigger chunks. Yeah, I guess um, one thing we haven't touched on too, just to round it out for the crop sort of stage is um, is drainage and and that sort of thing, which uh, we haven't looked at, Jimmy. I don't know about yourself, but yeah, like later on in the season, looking at these fields and how green they stay and different bays and different ways we can manage water towards drainage is going to be really interesting for this season. Um, most growers you speak to will say that it's one of the hardest things to get right. Like you can have everything pretty well nailed and if you drain two days too early or two days too late, uh, yeah, you're running into drama. So that's something going forward that is going to be good. Yeah, I think in fair with the drainage is that the 10 metre imagery is quite useful. Move yep. big enough areas. Yeah. Um, probably what needs teasing out there more is can you get a can you get a number? I don't think it's pretty hard to get whether the actual number can correlate to a draining date or a, you know the average across the paddock. I think it'd be hard to get that. Yeah. Vh seventy one last year seemed to stay green the later crops. So I don't think you'd ever get a number that would literally mean drain, but it's it's good for the scouting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. no, definitely yeah. change that. It's not literally drive around with your head out the window and try and pick the right spot. No, we're never going to get out walking out of paddocks, Jimmy. No, nah, unfortunately, we're never get around that. <laughs> Just yeah. it, so, yeah. so, I mean, a yeah. key a key part of the project, one of the key outcomes, is 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 working out harvest timing, and, and we're working with um, harvest contractors to to actually help them identify, you know which farm to go to first and then when they get there which paddock and then which bay should they start on and they're, they're the sort of critical decisions when it comes to harvest timing we, we we know that satellite data particularly ndvi in that case has got extremely good correlations with harvest moisture content so and again you don't like you said uh james you don't need the high res for that but the sentinel does a really good job of being able to pick up that the rate of change and so we think we can actually predict pretty pretty accurately the the final harvest date and maybe you just work a, a date back from that for, for draining but um, you know that we're, we're working on that particular issue and NDVI is one of the most most robust and reliable methods I've ever seen of, of predicting that so we might even be looking at the rate of change to a point um, you know that's that's the work we're doing at the moment with the harvest contractors yeah. 
Um, if there's no more questions from anyone online, um, that brings us up to exactly one hour, which is what I said was going to be. So um, really appreciate uh, AgriFutures uh, for, for um, sponsoring the webinar and, and our project and also Axel Space for sponsoring the webinar um, and supplying the data for the project. Um, it's been a, a great, um, a great partnership and um, we certainly look forward to continuing that um, um, into the future. And thanks very much uh, to James and Andrew for your time. I really appreciate it. It's a super busy time of year and it's just before Christmas. So everything's hitting the wall and um, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy days to share your experiences right in the mid season when things are happening. And we're showing you pretty much live imagery as we're getting it and, and trying to get that into the hands of, of everyone. So, you know, the data is freely available for people uh, in Australia, Australian rice farmers. All you have to do is log in uh, and the data should be processed if you've got your boundaries in. So um, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, have yeah, a Just one more before you go. What, what's yep. your capture dates? What's your anticipated capture dates? For well, uh, the, Cornell, you might want to talk about that. Yes. Uh, so, so James, and we are capturing it on on a regular basis on that. I think I think it's getting captured even when we talk uh, currently. So we have been continuing it capturing at least till end of Jan. Correct, James? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it's basically capturing every day when the satellite flies. No, it's not up. limited. Yeah. No. Okay. That's the way they're sort of working it. Is just continually capturing every time the satellite goes over. So. We should see again quite a few image captures during the season, um, even though we sort of set set some certain dates that we needed it. But it's just continually capturing. So as, as it comes in, we'll just process James, um, and 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 you should uh, either get an email or just open up hit high res, and the, the process data should be there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think also maybe thanks. Thanks, James and Andrew San for joining. Also, Tim San for organizing it. Thank you. Okay, I think it was a good session. And thanks from Excel Space. Okay, and 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 we are good that we are supporting you in this uh, specific growth initiative. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys.